Hello, my name is Brian Berry, and this is The Power of One. We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to busy lives, challenged by the political landscape and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything, that being civically involved will just lead to defeat and frustration. But what does it mean to feel empowered enough to take action on an issue of concern, to get in involved in a cause that is bigger than ourselves? Fortunately, however, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. They are creative and dynamic individuals who are fighting for what is right and for better lives for everyone. This program will show you that one person can make a difference, that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Today, my guest is Rabbi Joshua Levine Grader, who is the executive director of Friends of Deed here in Pasadena. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Brian. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here. Um, just to kick things off, why, you know, you have great experience as a rabbi and you had your own synagogue, but now you've transitioned into a nonprofit uh, capacity. Why, why do that? What motivate, motivated you to make that change? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I spent uh, 17 years as a congregational rabbi, and um, I was looking to do something different, a little bit different pace uh, of life, um, but I've always been passionate uh, about social justice and uh, had been involved in homelessness and hunger issues, and it was a natural fit uh, to continue to be able to lead and work with the team and to address um, a serious issue uh, that I care about deeply and that, um, you know, Friends Indeed is the fact that it's a religious interfaith, uh, faith-based mm -hmm. group was also what uh, drew me to them particularly. Well, when we talked um, a week or so ago, you mentioned that you had a little bit of a, a break or sabbatical in between the two and that you did some volunteering mm -hmm. and that, um, I think that that at least in our discussion, that was really impactful to you. Can you talk a little bit about the volunteer you did and what, how it has kind of shaped your view of Friends Indeed mm -hmm. and the work that you do? Sure. Yeah, so for several months, um, once, uh, once a week, I was uh, volunteering at uh, Union Station at, their, at the adult center during lunch um, mm -hmm. for a few hours. And sitting at the, the desk, you know, the front desk. And so it had a variety of, of, of uh, interactions, um, answering the phones, talking to the guests, um, trying to help find mail, um, lunch was being served, and the wonderful volunteers um, uh, serving the lunch. But oftentimes just being present with these folks and, and helping the best I can, staying out of the way of the staff, but, but to see for those several hours, A, the, the critical need uh, of the people coming uh, to eat and the diversity of people. And I never knew, um, you know, some people you would say they look homeless, or whatever, but some people, yeah. he's just an older gentleman and was hungry. And so, um, and then particularly seeing the, the staff there treat people with dignity and respect, which is what we care about most at Friends Indeed, but have them tell me, you know, just listen. They're gonna tell you stories, they're gonna tell you, and just, okay, all right, Mrs. Jones. But never belittling and never, yeah. okay, it's just really amazing. Yeah, can you think of any stories off the top of your head that you think were um, powerful or transformative for you? Or? So, <clears throat> a couple of, it was funny, a couple of, uh, uh, folks uh, that were regulars uh, like to joke with me. I was like, you know, because they know who's like a new volunteer. And then I learned, you know, because you have some of the stuff behind there. And mm -hmm. no, no, Josh, they, they said I can get 12 shampoos. You know, I, I can definitely, like, I don't, it doesn't seem like that's right. No, 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 it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, that's on like the funny side. You see a parent and a, a child come in and they're just looking for help and you know any any if you can get in and get a lunch ticket and have lunch then you can at least ask questions about any number of things I need to get to the doctor yeah. you see these sick people and, and trying in a wheelchair or hobbling and they have to get their medicine or they just got released from Huntington and mm -hmm. the the 
some of it was like the, there's like seeing the positivity of the community and the nice people, but also seeing the immense pain and yeah. suffering and like things that in some cases would be challenging for us to deal with, trying to get prescriptions or this. These folks, this is it. You're one yeah. shot this day to try and get some help. Yeah, I think there are some assumptions that are made about people who are homeless right. um, or stereotypes. Yeah. Um, in your experience at Union Station, now also at Friends Indeed, yeah. uh, are those are those stereotypes um, a bit twisted, shall we say, or are there, um, have you seen some people or heard some stories that make you think a little bit differently about who is homeless and how oh. they and how they got to be absolutely. Homeless? So, yes, just to put aside for the group that everyone you know thinks about yes there are mentally ill people yes there are folks who are addicts and folks who have you know messed up in life and can't seem to get things back let's put those aside right there are people who lost their job and now can't pay their rent and find themselves living in their car there's someone whose spouses died and now their social security is not coming and all of a sudden they can't uh, afford rent or food or one or the other. We have homeless college kids in the city and around the country, kids who, for whatever reason, uh, had one, one young uh, woman, just mom got a new boyfriend who's an addict and the boyfriend didn't like her and kicked, kicked, kicked her, her out. Mom kicked her out, 19, just, just couch surfing, doesn't, she comes to us. She has a yeah. bus token, she has a backpack. So, and <clears throat> a lot of senior citizens, Brian, a lot of senior citizens come into the food pantry. Seniors at the homeless shelter. We had this past year, on one night, we had five people over the age of 70 just in the homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, um, again, um, make characterizations or they, they make assumptions about the people who are on the street. But um, the Atlantic Monthly about a year ago uh, wrote an article about the state of, not the economy overall, but how the economy impacts each one of us. And so the question by the author was, do you have $400 cash that if you had some sort of emergency or the car breaks down, right. you have to go to exactly. um, you know, urgent care, um, maybe you know your kid needs some books or something like that really really quickly do you have four hundred dollars that you could um, pull together scrape together and it was astounding uh, the the number it's only like thirty percent well like thirty percent of Americans could not pull together four hundred dollars right. so in that fragility or in that um, kind of um, scenario um, do you see that there are a lot of people who are right on the margins and um, that could become homeless, you know, with an illness or sure. an accident or? Sure. So one of the actual pr most important programs um, that we do that is is uh, probably less well known because it's more behind the scenes, but is the case management of uh, homeless prevention. So Friends Indeed's the only homeless prevention provider. Uh, meaning this, if you are on the verge of homelessness, all those scenarios you just mentioned yeah. uh, can lead to, yes, three-day eviction notice, don't have person last month, I, I, I can't pay the, uh, the rent, I'm $100 short on the rent. And all studies show it is much more effective and cheaper to keep people housed than to have them become homeless and then try to get them housed. So we deal with folks all in rentals, who are poor. These are poor people, and you know they're not homeless, but they could be. They're yeah. not like they're hanging on yeah, day by right day, on right on that edge. And so we are ramping up our, our homeless prevention, and um, you know some of the monies from Measure H, which maybe we'll talk about, yeah. is um, for that. And it's it's because we want to keep people housed that's really critical and so we're we're ramping up our case management and able to help and hopefully not just uh, that's what we've been doing up till now try and help you out with whatever little bit or a little bit more that you need for this one or two times the goal now is going to be to do that but also expand the case management so we work with people are you budgeting are you able to manage so you can 
sustainably yeah. be housed and introduce them to our services. You come to the women's room, come, here's the food pantry. You can subsidize so you don't, you can subsidize because you get free food and then you can have that money for, for rent or for medicine or yeah. something. Let's go back to, um, and I think the prevention is really, really important because if you can stabilize people at least a little bit, yeah. and there are, there are multiple ways to do that. I think some right. churches, they pool resources and they've tried to prevent people right. when they hear of someone losing a job. Right. So maybe it's some bridge money to keep them going. Exactly. But let's go back to the homelessness um, issue overall in a couple of um, areas. One is, um, it, it seems like there are more homeless people on the streets all the time, or at least certainly in Pasadena when you go to Lake Avenue and the freeway, the 210 or mm -hmm. um, old Pasadena, it seem, uh, the Playhouse District, seems like there are a lot of people. But I do know that the uh, homeless count has indicated that there's been a drop. So, um, but the public perception is right. that there are more folks on the street. Right. Um, why do you think that there's a discrepancy between the two of those? Sure. Um, primarily because the development in Pasadena is happening at such a rapid pace. We're building huge, on Walnut, huge condominium complexes, mm -hmm. huge townhouse complexes. Those places were in the past where these folks would sleep or in camp or be kind of out of sight. Maybe they're out during the day doing, you know, either either asking or, 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 you know, whatever, standing on the corners or doing the different uh, things to try and get uh, some some money. But now, with all this development, um, these folks are uh, forced to be out at the bus stops and in the park and in different locations with your big shopping cart, so there's no place to stay or in the parks. Mm -hmm. And so that's right. So it's when we say numbers are down, which we're doing okay at least, in at Pasadena. At least locally. Yeah, locally, wanna, Pasadena. I want to ask you about L.A. County in a minute. But. You know, um, but uh, perception-wise, yes. It seems like there's more people because the, the unsheltered, the, the unsheltered, the chronically homeless, it's been a kind of a steady to a little bit rising number because if you could be homeless but couch surfing or you're in a shelter or you're doing, but you're unsheltered is what we're seeing. Chronically so, homeless. So it's it's more visible now. Yes. So right. Might not be more people, but you're seeing them more. Yeah. Out in the open because they're mm -hmm. losing. It's two percent vacancy rate here in Pasadena, and yeah. so we have a hard time housing, and we're building such giant things, the little alleys and areas that they might yeah. have been staying in. Um, we could talk a little bit about um, affordable housing, although um, I'd like to keep talking about um, yeah homelessness, but. But um, in all of those complexes that are being built, is there, as far as you know, are there affordable units in those? Um, there, I don't have exact uh, numbers. I don't want to misquote or say, but I, you know, there is, like I said, two percent vacancy in Pasadena. There are, uh, other than the permanent supportive housing uh, 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 operations that we have that Union Station runs, there are units here of affordable housing here. And there, there are growing numbers. It's about the developers and the landlords being willing to take a Section 8 voucher. We have a backup of Section 8 vouchers. Uh, oh, there's a waiting list. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's hundreds of people. Yes. Yes. And so we don't have enough units. Um, and it's been but, a challenge to get in units. those units. You can either offer affordable housing there's an in lieu fee in the city. This gets more into the weeds of like the policy of, of what the developer can do. Um, housing department will say that developers are pr providing more units, but even if you know we need like uh, uh, thousands of units to, to yeah. not just the homeless, but you know or at least a couple of hundred units uh, to make a yeah. substantial difference. And um, when you can rent. Now, there's no law that says the, you know, we try, the city council has talked about, do you, can you demand that you have to have affordable housing? Because if I can rent the unit for 3000 a month, why would I do it for 1200 Yeah, it's, it's well, that goes back to a social justice issue, and so I, you yes. know, I think it's philosophical. Yes. And, um, but if we're talking about a community that cares about all of its residents, then you would, uh, I think, try to 
um, push a little bit harder in that arena. Yeah, we need some pressure. But the reason why I was asking about the affordable aspect of it is if you have people who are right on the margins, um, but they're paying market rate, that makes it more difficult for them yeah. to, to survive. We have but one of the highest rental uh, in, at least in LA County. You mean cost-wise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that could be one area where, if we're talking about prevention, um, the expansion of uh, affordable housing unit or number of units, yeah. then that could be a preventive issue. Yes. So, um, but going back to um, uh, the county overall, uh, my understanding is that numbers are up. Why, why has Pasadena seen a drop, but I think it was LA Times a week or two ago said there was a, a dramatic increase in homelessness countywide. Right, so again, not to sp these numbers and these counts and all of the statistics that go with it, there's a lot of kind of when the last, I don't, like I said, get into the weeds of how the counts are done and when right. they're done and all of that. Yeah. I mean, we have a more manageable, we're a contained city. We have yeah. agencies that are working hard. We're, we do partner pretty well with the city housing department and in some cases the you know, city council and other local agencies to, to try and make a difference. Um, and uh, we have uh, our own continuum of care which is uh, kind of the HUD established it seven or eight years ago, that cities have these that where the homeless and affordable housing and helping the most vulnerable is, is in a city department. And so we have our most, except for Glendale, Pasadena, and Long Beach, everyone else is at the LA city, a mm. uh, county continuum of care. We have our own that, that come, and so, we what, have a, what exactly is continuum of care? It's or, it's a coalition of, of of different agencies. There's the faith part. There's the housing part. There's developers. There is people working together, uh, faith communities and uh, community partners to to cha channel funds uh, uh, into the community uh, for for mental health and for homelessness and for housing. So if I were um, a person who entered the system, like if I went to Union Station, mm -hmm. uh, what you're describing is a, sort of a wraparound service provision we, so that I could deal with maybe if I had anger management issues or um, uh, addiction issues, those could be mm -hmm. taken care of as well so then ultimately I could be We housed. try to do that. A different agencies work together to provide, yeah, as much yeah. Uh, as support as we can. Yeah, great, that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk for a minute about Measure H and what are the implications for Measure H in Pasadena and in particular for Friends in Need? Mm -hmm. So Measure H is, um, is a wonderful, can be a wonderful thing. We hope it's gonna be a wonderful thing. It's a complicated uh, bond, a 10 year uh, measure to provide uh, $355 million a year for 10 years around homeless services, it's the quarter cent sales tax that um, was passed by the voters. Um, you know, rolling out any sort of major project like that through the county, the supervisor, board of supervisors is essentially in charge of that uh, money, distributing that money. There's been dozens of summits and meetings and um, they are, the board is set to vote on uh, June 13th uh, about how it's going to unroll and un where we can apply for funds. Um, Pasadena is, uh, like, because we have our own continuum of care, it's a little bit more complicated that we could get our own funds. Uh, at this point, there's still negotiation as we're, uh, as we're on this show right now. Um, so the hope is that for Friends Indeed that we have projects that we can apply to the different, uh, um, either through our own uh, housing continuum of care, if we get uh, uh, our own allotment of money. Um, and because there are what's called uh, SPAs, service provider areas. Yeah. And so there's eight of them, we're number three, and it's gonna get divided based on you know percentages and, and pie charts of who has what and, and numbers of homelessness. And But we, we will get funds and then friends indeed will be eligible to apply uh, for our programs. And the hope is that um, we'll be able to get some longer term funding. So to say, we're gonna do this program either 
expand our homeless prevention, street outreach, to go out on the street and to get a name list, a by name list of these folks, get to know our homeless people so that we can help bring them off the streets, build the relationships, to tell them we're doing this, I'd love two or three years worth of guaranteed funding. That's what we're hoping for Measure H, since it's a 10 year thing. Do we, so most, a lot of grants and stuff are year to year. So there's a possibility they might give multiple year grants. We hope so. We'll, well find out, they, they, they're getting delayed. They were supposed to accept, yeah. collect the tax July, now they're not collecting it till October, so things are gonna be a little off to begin with. Yeah, so you have, a, I think, a very creative idea, and you just uh, mentioned it, but I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about this whole notion of outreach workers in, in places around Latin America, there is a, a health promoter model, or promotores de salud, and so, um, they are um, trained individuals right. who, um, in healthcare, and they actually go to people's homes and they interview them, talk to them about their needs, and then help them to navigate the yes. system. And then um, yes. uh, either go to a clinic, or maybe even bring another healthcare professional to the house. So, what what is your hope for, or how is the the outreach worker program going to be designed, and right. um, what do you hope it will accomplish? Great. So yeah, this is, I mean, it's, it's not, we're not making this up, so I don't wanna say we're having a creative idea, but we are taking a best yeah. practice. Well, like it's a best yeah, practice. That makes sense. To go out on the street, we hope to get uh, some grant funding um, and uh, some, hopefully some matching uh, funds we need with it uh, to hire outreach workers, potentially two of them, to go onto the street. Their full-time job is to go around and to identify First of all, homeless pockets. Mm -hmm. We have places in our city where there's some congregate, you know, gatherings that we know about on Mentor near Old Town, near the Target right. in Colorado. There are some pockets yeah. over near uh, right by the Salvation Army. Salvation Army, yes, yeah. in little encampments. And so to begin to develop relationships, what I've learned, you know, Brian, in the last uh, you know five months that I've been doing this is that. The idea that someone comes up to you on the street and says, Brian, I'm, I'm Josh, I'm an outreach worker, you know, we have an apartment for you if you want to come with us and we could maybe get you housed. And everyone just thinks, oh, of course they're going to go. Well, yeah, who wouldn't who, go? Who wouldn't say yes? There's a lot of mistrust of folks on the street. There's a lot of people who have been on the street years and years. Some people say, I, I can't imagine living alone. I, I live, this is where I live. And we, we have to, these are human beings, some with mental health challenges and some just yeah. don't trust. And so the outreach worker builds relationship. The outreach worker is going to hopefully spend time every day getting to hopefully all the people, in our case particularly the women, 91 unaccompanied women, get to know them and hopefully get them on a list, our by name list, mm -hmm. eventually to feed them into what's called the CES, the Coordinated Entry System of which Union Station is our provider. Mm -hmm. They take them and they coordinate all the agencies that they would need to go through to get housed. Mm -hmm. And then our outreach workers go back and as soon as we can get someone, we get them intaked and then pass them to, to Union Station to hopefully do the navigation. Yeah. Great, that uh, sounds like it could be very, very effective. Um, a couple of years ago, I went out with the HOPE team, which is the Pasadena yes. Police Department's outreach yes. program. And we walked and then, in. Sorry, and the county has teams. There's outreach teams uh, through the county. And the, you know, yeah. people, it's really working to help. Yeah. But your, your model will be slightly different in that um, you're going to be creating trust with those individuals yes. and going back over and over again. Yes. And, um, because yes. I think, um, I think uh, the other models are slightly different. But we went to the intersection of the the 134 and the one or the um, 210 mm -hmm. freeways and the 710, right. and in in those um, planted areas, right. there are significant numbers of folks who live there. Will your outreach workers be able to go into those? Um, we're going. That's like off the 110 down towards the. No, no, no. The 110. 210, 134. No, it's right where Parsons is. Oh, right there. And there's. Um, there are slopes, there are hillsides. Yes. Oh, there, our folks, anywhere in Pasadena, we're going to try to uh, try to get to. That's the goal, first of all. Pa pass, which is going to start in Pasadena. Yeah. But we will but be it, asking for anyone that you know that we start to learn about uh, areas to make sure that we touch. 
That's great. It's a, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an area where there are a lot of people who are living. Okay. Um, they're camping, essentially. Yeah, right. So um, just a, a couple of questions to wrap up. One is that, um, so when you have people who come to you and say, well, what do I do when a homeless person approaches me or they're standing you know, at Laking um, Corson and I'm about to turn mm -hmm. and they're asking for some money, how, right. what, how, what do you tell people? How should they respond in those situations? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges we face, and I'm I'm you know I would like to help everyone that I see, and and a couple of things, I'm not a person who is going to say, and I could be faulted for this, that, that if you give them a dollar, if you have something, that that's a bad thing, because these folks, you know, I'll tell you a story. I gave someone just a older man standing out. I mean, I gave someone ten dollars, right? Could and. He started praying for me, and he was so gracious. I mean, and this is $10. So there's, I'm not against the money. I would advise having a, a, a Ziploc freezer bag of, of supplies, of all the toiletries, a little travel size, some socks, underwear, uh, uh, bras for women. Those are always needed, and some granola bars, and have packages. Hand that to the person when you're driving off the freeway, they will be most mm -hmm. grateful. Because the things we take for granted, shampoo, toothpaste, mouthwash, soap, all those things. Um, and at the base, just, if these people feel invisible, even if you don't have anything, and you're stop, hey, God bless you, hang in there. Because mm -hmm. otherwise they just feed people just I don't see you, and they just feel like they right. just stand there with their sign. So even to wave, smile, mm -hmm. that is meaningful. And that's a, another social justice issue. When you um, dehumanize people, mm -hmm. then you can do pretty much anything to them. Pretty much. And so the humanization of the, the homeless to recognize right. that they have Right. value in our community. I think that's really, really important. Right, and Friends Indeed, that's our mission, to help people when they're there feel uh, dignified and respected and try, like everyone else, to just feel like a human being. Yeah, and every time I go in there, I feel like it's a, you know, kind of a warm, fuzzy yes, place. Yes, that's what we try. So, for a few hours that they're there. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking oh, the thank time. You. And I, I also want to thank you for the work that you do and the work that Friends Indeed does. So, I appreciate it. So this is fantastic, and um, I think I learned uh, quite a bit about um, what we're doing in the community. So thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, yeah. Brian.